This video is brought to you by Blessed Be God Boutique, maker of Catholic fashionable apparel, handmade accessories, and more. The authorities of the church kneel before the world instead of kneeling before Christ. In fact, they kneel before the world to avoid kneeling before Christ the King. That's a paraphrasing of words from an Italian theologian priest that I'll end this discussion with today, and he is absolutely right. And I'll endeavor to show you how. We have news out of Rome that the next big event after the Synod of Synodality is being planned as you watch this, and that they've already developed their logos, marketing materials, and almost certainly the messaging they want to go along with it, which is what I'm mostly concerned about. Francis may barely be able to walk these days, but he is planning with his modernist allies the next big thing in the church, and his planning continues unabated. So be ready for what on the surface appears to be the merely banal, but the merely boring, but really represents a further secularization of the faith in increments. So let's dive into the story. The Synod of Synodality isn't even finished yet, and the next weird thing is already being planned, as I mentioned. And like every synod pushed by Francis, there's some subtle symbolic messaging going on with this, even though it's not a synod, and the symbolic messaging isn't terribly subtle, but it does point to what the sum of the focus will be. Headline from the Catholic News Agency, winning 2025 Jubilee Year logo unveiled after global competition. And here's the logo. Yeah, that's a predictable display of colors from across the spectrum that has many asking if Pastor Jimmy Martin of the Jesuit Church was involved in the design process. But at least there's Latin in that slogan, right? From the article, quote, The Vatican Evangelization Chief unveiled on Tuesday the winning logo of the 2025 Jubilee Year, chosen after worldwide competition. Archbishop Rhino Fisichella, pro-prefect of the Dicastery for Evangelization, presented the logo and the preparations for the Catholic Church's next Holy Year at a June 28th press conference. A jubilee is a holy year of grace and pilgrimage in the Catholic Church, which typically takes place every 25 years. The motto, the motto of the 2025 jubilee is Pilgrims of Hope, Peregnets and Spem in Latin. A Vatican press release described the logo as four stylized figures to indicate all of humanity from the four corners of the earth. They are embracing one another, indicating the solidarity and brotherhood that must unite peoples, it continued. It should be noted that the first figure is clinging to the cross. The underlying waves are choppy to indicate that the pilgrimage of life is not always on calm waters. Oftentimes, personal circumstances and world events call for a greater sense of hope. This is why the lower part of the cross is elongated, turning it into an anchor, which dominates the movement of the waves. As is well known, the anchor has often been used as a metaphor for hope, it said. End quote. They don't want you using that image for commercial reasons, by the way, like making t-shirts or stickers, although for media, it's fine. And I know many of you are thrilled with this imagery and can't wait to do your part. I'm kidding, of course, but this isn't that surprising. The Vatican has a penchant for the banal that probably wasn't intended to send signals to Pastor Jimmy Martin, but it still evokes that kind of imagery for many watching. But another big event is coming, barely two years after the scheduled closure of the Synod on Synodality next year in late 2023. And this one is going to be a doozy. But as Jubilee years of mercy go, we've had these before. Remember, in 2015, Francis offered indulgences for visiting and praying at certain cathedrals or holy sites in your diocese and for going to confession, which honestly I'm fine with. But this marketing campaign is turning heads for all the expected reasons. And I want to frame the marketing campaign with the ongoing synod of synodality because that is now bearing a fruitful harvest of rotten fruit. That's not going to stop them from planning their next big church event. You'd think they'd be more laser focused on the terrible results coming from the various synodal national assemblies, but they're not. They're not even that concerned by the results since the outcome is almost certainly predetermined. Here's one example. The bishops of France are lamenting the poor showing of their synodal assemblies and noting how little focus on the faith was in the various parish and lay listening session reports. They even lament the lack of participation from traditional Catholics despite across the board none of us really being involved to participate. Did your parish get invited? I didn't think so. This is what we should expect more of in the coming days as these reports roll out across the Catholic world. Headline from Crux International. Governance, place of women. France drafts its synod report. The bishops of France issue binding text on the future of the church in their country, a text that was revised to include calls for reform that emerged during local synodal consultations. 
We're seeing more of these reports coming from national bishops conferences, and I've seen many of you in the comments of videos agreeing with me, saying that the outcome of these listening sessions that many of you took part in in good faith were actually predetermined from the beginning, since the documents issued by bishops clearly show that none of the concerns raised by the laity were included in the documents, and that instead they were filled with a kind of nonsense that French bishops are actually promoting here. See if this sounds familiar to you. From the article, quote, Catholic bishops of France have written a cover letter to the national synthesis of the diocesan phase of the Synod on Synodality, producing a text that was significantly revised at the last minute to include calls for reform that emerged during the months of consultations with the laity. The bishops approved the text during an extraordinary assembly of their National Episcopal Conference, which took place Tuesday and Wednesday at the Catholic University of Lyon. They invited more than 100 people representing the laity, permanent deacons, and religious orders to attend the assembly, which was to officially mark the conclusion of the diocesan phase of the synod. It's estimated that more than 150,000 French Catholics participated in the synodal consultations, which were launched last October. By the end of two intense days of work, largely behind closed doors, the bishops approved the cover letter that will be sent to Rome along with the recently prepared national synthesis. This text commits them. It will be up to each one to follow the rhythm of his diocese, said Bishop Alexander Jolie of Troyes, who led the national team dedicated to the synod. What are the highlights of the cover letter? We hear the strong expectations that have been expressed, the bishops write. They then detail what they perceive to be five priorities. The bishops also lament that the synodal process has not reached all the people of God in their diversity. They cite in particular traditionalist Catholics and young people. It is noteworthy that the cover letter the bishops passed points out certain absences and themes brought up from the field. The mission, the, wish of, the witness of Christians on major societal issues, ecology and international solidarity matters. The family is a place for learning about fraternity is not mentioned, the bishops note. They voice regret that certain Catholic spiritual riches, the sacraments, consecrated life, the celibacy of priests, the diaconate, etc., were often ignored or devalued. After a few amendments, the cover letter was adopted by the bishops almost unanimously before being presented to the invitees with applause. Interesting, dynamic, the entirety really met, meets our expectations, confirmed a Catholic from central France. The two documents must now be sent to Rome, which has asked for Episcopal contributions in addition to the national summaries. End quote. Traditional Catholics gave little or no input officially because we're not invited to these listening sessions. Did your FSSP parish or Institute of Christ the King parish have synodal listening sessions? The SSPX were never going to be involved in, invited to these in the first place due to their canonical status. But I know for a fact that the, S, the FSSP in Oklahoma did not. The dioceses ignore traditional Catholics as best they can, which for the most part is quite frankly fine. We don't want to be noticed by the modernists in Rome or in the local chanceries. But in cases like this where we might be invited to get feedback on the state of the church, it would ni be nice to not be involved and ignored. We've got a lot to say on these kind of matters, which is actually why we're ignored in the first place. And the bishops then lament that people who might remind them of the need for strong families and focuses on the sacraments and devotional life are not included or even mentioned, as the French bishops here themselves said. The saddest part of the stories out of France is, well, this. There are something like 30 million Catholics in France, and only 150,000 of them participated. That is one half of 1%, give or take. And it's abysmal. But it's not that far off the abysmal mass attendance rates in that country either. Maybe the French bishop should look at the correlation between the two. If you thought that was bad, this is worse. The UK bishops have released their report, and there's a certain, shall we call it, James Martin flair to the whole mess. The UK bishops want to regularize sins that cry out to heaven, and they're openly calling for it in their synodal document. Thanks to Deacon Nick Donnelly for sharing this on Twitter. Quote, James Martin groups who organized synodal meetings in Westminster Diocese were grateful for a twice-monthly mass, wow, specifically for them, but otherwise felt they were rendered invisible. The constant voice in the reports laments the exclusion and sidelining of James Martin groups. Stories were shared in which they are singled out or made unwelcome, subject to prejudice and hostility. In other cases, church teaching or perceptions of God were seen as inhibiting self-acceptance. Self-acceptance. One such person said that she had a breakdown trying to reconcile her faith with her fleshly desires. A report described the James Martin crowd as in no way angry with the church, just hurt. And mostly, quote, Ah, oh, yes, self-acceptance, that uh, critical Catholic value. But notice the implication that the church must change its teachings in the name of synodality and being friendly. 
This is what we're talking about here when we say that the prelates of the church are sacrificing the faith for material concerns. Once the church goes down this road, there's no coming back from it. This side of a civilization smashing cataclysm and the modernists know it. I'll say it again. The church now kneels before the world and not Christ the King. Monsignor Bucks, an Italian theologian priest, warns us of this in a statement clearly aimed at the German Synod, but it really applies to the Vatican and everything else in light of what I've told you today. The authorities of the church are stripping the altars and ignoring Christ in the name of material worries and material concerns. The statement of his comes from Marco Tosati's website, and I'll have links to it in the today's show notes at returntotradition.org if you want to see it for yourself. But here's the statement, quote, is it possible that even on the occasion of corpus domine, the leitmotif should be the poor in the environment? Isn't it the feast of that sacrament that alone can take away the hunger for God, which is the radical poverty of man? Yet at the beginning, the sequence laudation recalls it. The theme special of today's praise is the living bread that gives life. Then we announce and praise that God who became flesh and then living bread to nourish us in this world, and thanks to this to resurrect us in the other. More and more are those who know nothing about Jesus Christ, while about the poor, etc., they hear about it in abundance. Did he not assure us that we will always have the poor with us, but we will not always have him? Mysterious words. But it reminds us that he did not come to solve the problem of poverty or to bring universal peace, but to make God present in the world. For this we must honor him, yes, even with drapes and gold and lights, because he is the Lord and the King of the universe. St. John Chrysostom reminds us not to separate the honor given to Christ in the liturgy and the honor given to Christ in the poor. Do you want to honor the body of Christ? Well, don't tolerate him being naked. After having honored him here in the church with silk fabrics, do not let him die outside from cold and nakedness. I say this not to forbid you from honoring Christ with such gifts, but to ex exhort you to offer help to the poor together with those gifts, or rather to make concrete help precedent precede the symbolic gifts. While you adorn the church, do not despise your brother who is in need. In fact, he is as much more precious temple than the other. That is an excerpt from St. John Chrysostom's commentary on the second letter to the Corinthians. We do not mention halfway in which the Catholic parish is the poor, not taken care of. The presence of Jesus Christ in the poor is moral, while that in the sacrament is true, real, substantial, a big difference. A corpus domini, therefore, let us take care of him, and let us not disturb the processional prayer with sociological captions and ideological comments that do not help to adore. Above all, let us remember that the procession is a sacramental, that is, it must help many who are far away, to get closer to God, to grasp his presence. For this reason, St. Thomas invites us to dare as much as possible in praising the sacrament. How could the many young people and adults be at least intrigued and, like Zacchaeus, get up from the tables and smartphones of which they are intent, if the most holy zigzagging between the pedestrian areas of the city is a trumpet carried almost stealthily, without even a lamp to light it up, a trumpet to announce its passage. Who notices the passing of the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings? Where did the symbols loved by the liturgists go? Then the procession should be accompanied by litanies, a Greek word that remembers the particular repeated short form of prayer born for the ancient stations. That is the processional paths from one church to another. Instead of intellectualist intentions, if not ideological and therefore cloying, let the litanies of the Blessed Sacrament be recited, and litanies of the Madonna and those of the saints. Why not? The Lord in heaven does not live alone, but with Mary, the angels, and the saints, and on earth he works with their intercession. On the repertoire of the sacred songs, we refer to the severe judgments of the Benedictine Anselmo Susca, Dominicio Bartolucci, and Riccardo Muti, in order not to go back to the nihilistic ones of Nietzsche. I would like songs of saved people. Finally, what was a Protestant gazebo doing in the Main Street Cross by the procession where they continued their assembly without even reducing the loudspeaker volume? Whether or not they knew that there was the Corpus Domini procession, at least respect. I'm not saying ecumenism. So if the world gets corrupted, let's not complain. Salt of Christianity has become tasteless in our liturgies as if he were not present and listening. Empty dances around the golden calf that we are ourselves. It is we clerics who favor secularization, and we will pay dearly for it said John Paul II, and we see it. In order not to kneel before Christ, we are kneeling before the world. How many masters end up having those who reject the one Lord, saith St. Ambrose, end quote. Monsignor Bucks is always a good source for Catholic truth to compare these things with. We must resist and reject the banality promoted by Rome that is being passed off as Catholic. We must reject the surrender to the world that we're expected to embrace without question. 
the synodal documents are pointing to an actualized apostasy unfolding in the church, with people remaining within the confines of institutions that have themselves already left the actual faith. That's really the only explanation for any of this, and it leaves me wondering, what is coming next? What doozy of a statement is Francis going to foist on us in this jubilee year of mercy? He'll absolutely have a document to release for that year, and you know it's going to be a doozy. So let me know in the comments what you think this will be, or what you think of this jubilee logo, or about these synodal listening sessions and the documents that have come out of them. Were they predictable? Let me know what you think. And like and subscribe if you haven't. It really does help. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.